It's going to be a great day and a great week. I'm your host, Arielle Chanel, and we are back with another episode, and you know I'm excited to be here. It's Love Month. If you watched last week, we're celebrating Tiffany, hallelujah, and her story and everything that she's gone through her journey. I don't want to share her story for her, so if you didn't get a chance to see it, please go back and watch last week's episode. It was amazing. And thank you to everyone that reached out and let me know what you thought about the episode, what you thought about Tiffany. I hope you were able to connect with her because she is amazing, as you can see. And before we get into who this handsome young man is next to me for today, we start every week with gratitude. So I am grateful for Black Love. It's Black History Month. Today is Black Love Day. And I have always been a lover of just the relationship between black people, black men, black women, their children, all the different aspects of it. And so I figured what better way than to show some love to a black man that I admire, black and brown man that I admire and really love his story, everything about who he is. So I am going to just get right to it and introduce you all to my friend, David Valle. David, I want you to let the people know more about you from your own words. Um, I'm David Duvalier. I'm 29 years old. I'm a college student at Tufts University Prison Initiative. I was just incarcerated for eight years. I'm recently released. I've been home about four months. And let me tell you, I've been feeling the black love. That's for sure. I've been promoting it everywhere we go. You know, I just, there's no more beautiful thing in the world. And I'm happy to be here on Black Love Day. Now, you know, it makes my day to be here, you know, be surrounded by my, by my friend. Let me show black love to my friend Ariel. <laughs> yes. here. It's, you know, it's, it's a beautiful day. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you guys have me here. Yes, so I met David, how long has it been now? About like a year, a year six months, oh, seven yep. months. It feels longer because... It was Juneteenth last year. That's yeah. it. So Juneteenth of last year, I met David at an event. And he'll talk more about it himself and his journey. But from that day, just meeting him, I could see greatness on him and could see that he wasn't anything that some people might think and what you might automatically assume going into the situation that he was in. But you could just tell there was something special about him. And we got connected along with another good friend of ours and we all just ended up kind of staying in touch in a really random way and one thing that I'll say about David that he might share later is that he is also an amazing baker and has to this day made the best cinnamon rolls that I've ever had so David before we talk a little bit about the journey of how we met at the event Let's talk about your life before that, before that time, because you didn't just start out incarcerated. That's not the way life works. So tell us a little bit about young David. Um, Young David was kind of just, I don't know, I feel like I had potential in me, but I was just unsure of myself. I didn't, I don't know, I didn't know who I was. I was struggling to find myself as a kid. I grew up with a single mother. You know, she raised me, my brother and sister, you know, low-income housing in rural Massachusetts. Um, so that kind of, you know, I had a, we had a rough upbringing. You know how it is in the inner city, we, you know, we, we're a little tougher than the, the suburbs. <laughs> we go through a little more. And yeah, I don't know, I just, I played basketball, I played a lot of sports. I was in and out of schools, just like I said, unsure of myself and just never really took anything kind of seriously until I was incarcerated, until it hit me that I was like, all right, your life, you know, you made a drastic change in your life now how am I going to respond to this how you know how do I move forward how do I respond from a, a 10 and a half year sentence as a 21 year old kid so yeah my life was there was something before but I don't know I feel like my redemption story my story really finding David started while I was incarcerated okay so before we get to finding David if you could go back to young David's mind what did you see for yourself when you thought of your future when you were young? I didn't really understand the context of like what I was gonna be or what I was gonna do. I just know like I grew up with no single mother. I seen her struggle. I saw that she was you know, 
sick black woman with health complications who didn't really have a career path and I just I knew I wanted to help her. I had a daughter at 18 years old, you know, raising a, a little brown girl in this world is not easy. So I also wanted to, you know, be a good role model for her in whatever way I could be. I was, was always a hardworking man since I was 14 years old, just trying to provide as best as I could. And yeah, I just knew that I was, I don't know, I was ambitious, I was hungry, I was determined, I just didn't know to do what. So that ambition was always there. The hunger was always there. But the direction wasn't there. And so you end up finding yourself incarcerated at a young age. Can you tell us about your story, your journey to being incarcerated? Like what happened that led you to see our dear state system? So, like I said, I grew up with a single mother. I had a daughter. I was 18. I was working a job. But I was also hustling marijuana on the side to try and make ends meet. I was doing pretty good for myself. Had a couple cars, had my nice little apartment or whatever, doing my little thing. And apparently there was some people who, you know, weren't too happy to see me gaining, gaining financial success. One of them happened with my cousin. He was addicted to drugs. He was a gang member. I was just a regular hardworking man. He had came into my house and robbed me. I didn't really know how to respond. I wasn't like, I was emotionally underdeveloped. I didn't know, you know, I was, it was like a high emotional, intense situation. And I responded impulsively. I saw him, words were exchanged, and we ended up getting into a violent altercation, and I shot the man. I was sentenced to 10 and a half years in prison. And that was pretty much like that chapter, like leading, that was my transition from like being a young adult working to being sentenced. Wow. That's, it's always crazy to hear how quickly things can change and go from one minute, you're just trying to make ends meet. You're just trying to do what you can to provide and to be the man that you wanted to be in your eyes. And next thing you know, it, it leads to something else. And so if you can, can you talk about what was it that made you feel that you had to um, shoot your cousin? Or what was it for you that was like, I felt like this it, is the, the answer? I don't know. I felt like it was bigger than the material things. Like, I felt emasculated. I felt victimized. I felt the social pressure from, like, the other people in my neighborhood as well. I didn't want anybody to think I was weak. I didn't want anybody to think I was soft in any way. Or I was any less of a man because I allowed somebody to rob me and victimize me and I didn't respond accordingly to the way that people believed that I should respond. So it was, honestly, I did it out of, out of fear. I didn't want to be ostracized in my own community. I didn't want to be looked at as, you know, a, a snitch if I called the police. So I I, was, I tried to escalate, but that isn't that isn't love. That's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm perpetuating a negative narrative that people tell us that, you know, black men are supposed to attack and black men are supposed to be dangerous and we're supposed to be savages and no, like, we are compassionate people. When somebody does something wrong to you, that doesn't automatically give you the right to go above and beyond and try to hurt that man or take them because now, look at the, the problem again between two individuals. And yes, I, that man hurt me by robbing me. I went back and hurt him, but the community was hurt. The, there were so many people who had to witness that crime that are traumatized for the rest of their life. His family's traumatized. They had to see him in a hospital bed. My family's traumatized. They had to see me incarcerated in a jumpsuit for years on end. So like, that's why I want to perpetuate black love. That's why I want to perpetuate love because I've caused harm in my community. I've caused harm to people I love. And my only way to kind of repair that or make an attempt to repair that is to perpetuate love in the way I go. That's dope. So I'm talking about perpetuating love or even seeing the way um, love works. I know we talk about how everything happens for a reason and how we could see how love guides us and helps us out. In this process for you, what was the thing that helped guide you to see David in a new light? I don't, it was just all the love that I received from people. Like, no matter how cast off society tried to push me, no matter how negative of a light the newspapers or, you know, 
victims or whoever witnesses try to paint me as a man, there were still people who saw me as the good man that I was, who saw me for all the good I did. Not that 10 second clip of bad. They saw me as the collective body of work of my entire life. My daughter, my mother, my sister, like people I've met along the way, like Ariel. Like there's so many people who just affirmed me no matter how bad off I really was. And that inspired me, that motivated me to just keep going and searching for myself and honestly just loving myself as a black man. Cause I don't know, I feel like there's a narrative in society where people tell you like, oh, you have to be worried about being so hard or tough or having pride or ego that you can't have self-love, you can't give yourself a self-affirmation as a black man because now you're, oh no, you're weak because you have to affirm yourself. No, it's like we have to find self. Before we can give love to anybody else as black people to our community, we have to first find self and love self first and foremost. Dope. So with that being said, in finding self and loving self, what are five things you love about you, David? Oh, uh, my sense of humor. I am so goofy. Like, I make a joke out of anything. Like, we could be anywhere in the most professional setting, and I'm going to try and make somebody laugh. Um... I'm super engaging with people. Like, I love to walk up to people and meet people from all walks of life, different cultures, different languages. Like, I'm a super explorer. I'm very adventurous. Like, I love to just, I've never snowboarded in my life and I just randomly jumped on a snowboard and just fell a thousand times just to say I did it. Like, just stuff like that. I don't know. Um, I'm athletic. Like, I've always been, I've been a basketball player. I've been working out since I was a kid. And it's just, it's given me like a different sense of being present. It's like my therapeutic sense like it helps me be at one with my body and my health and like i try to push that on my the people that i love as well and one last i'm a family man i'm a family man i enjoy those moments with the people that i love that exchange and just energy with the people that you share dna with even if they're not your blood relatives like if you hold them close in your heart those moments where you can bring all those people together is just i cherish them more than anything else in the world nice so I guess we'll start there because I like to dig a little bit deeper in the things that you say you love. And since you talked about family and the smile that you have on your face, you talked about having a daughter before and that you had your daughter at 18. Let's talk a little bit about that relationship, especially talking about black love and having that relationship with a father and a daughter and how special that is. So if you can just share a little bit about your relationship with your daughter. Um, my relationship with my daughter is like the strongest bond that I could ever describe. Like that little girl is literally my spitting image. It's like watch, watching myself, like the little confidence that she has, her little bravery to walk up to people and her little personality is just, it shines through everywhere. Like she, I'll have the worst days sometimes and she'll text me like, dad, what are you doing? And FaceTime me and it's just, she picks my spirit up over and over and over again. Like, that is the greatest blessing that God has ever sent me, was that little girl. Like, on my darkest days, she picks me up. Like, I don't I don't know what I would do without her. Like, she's literally, like, my heart on the outside of my body. <laughs> that's, that's dope. I love, I love watching relationships of fathers and daughters. And you and your daughter have an amazing relationship. If people have a chance to get to know you and see you, they'll definitely see her because you have no problem sharing that love that you have with her and you guys bond in the things that you do so that's really exciting and with that do you feel that having a daughter was something that helped you as well in your journey are of discovery and discovering who you are the, what's inside of you I'll say yes I would say having a daughter helped me a lot because it, it taught me to see the world like not so objectively from a male perspective. When I would see like the women's struggles of the US women's soccer team or the women weren't getting paid the same amount as men at certain jobs, it was like, hold on, my daughter's like, hold up, my daughter's a woman. Like we're not, I don't want my daughter getting cut short on anything in life or getting oppressed or marginalized in any way, shape or form. So it just taught me to have empathy for like, you know, the women's movement, for every woman I come into contact with, that, that is somebody's daughter. Like that is somebody's nana. The way that I cherish my daughter, like, let me treat this woman with the decency and respect that, you know, her family would appreciate. So it's just, it taught me to just be a better human being all around. Nice. I want to shift 
a little bit and I know that you said you are somebody who is adventurous and you love exploring and learning and with that learning you are in school correct yes I am <laughs> you want to talk a little bit about your journey with school yeah my journey with education was like super unconventional so like I was a good student my whole life I played sports then I got into high school you know I started smoking selling weed or whatever and just stopped caring about education but I always had the talent and intelligence I just never applied it I don't know if it was like I lost interest or just the whole school dynamics just I don't know but upon coming to prison I started reading slowly but surely like older gentlemen would come hand me books and I would you know devour them give them back and discuss the topics whether it was indigenous civilization or African in South Africa apartheid like there were so many just things Malcolm X that I had just read on my own that was just so empowering so in 2018 there was, I had actually gotten into college. There was a Tufts University program at MCI Concord. And the woman who the woman who came in, like her name is Dr. Hillary Binder, she changed my life forever. That lady has enlightened me so much. And I've just ran with it. Like I've honestly like just gone back to my community, gone back to every person I come into contact with and try to educate them and help them in any way, shape, or form that I can. Um, upon my reentry, so I'm about to get my associate's degree in a couple months. And then I'll be matriculating into Tufts University for my four-year degree this fall. Yes. But it's just the journey has been so long and it's been so great that like, I don't know, upon my release, that was my first. I was just unsure of anything else. The only thing I knew was I wanted a college degree. I wanted to be able to be the first college graduate in my family so I, I could be a role model to my daughter and show her that college is possible for her. Whether you're from the inner city, whether you're Puerto Rican, you're black, you're impoverished, it doesn't matter. If you're intelligent, your talent will shine through and these institutions will be ready to give you a degree. So I'm just trying to perpetuate that. Like I want to show people that education is love, teaching is love, learning is love. Like we got to do this together. And I don't know, like somebody came and taught me, people loved me enough to come and stop out of their busy time to educate me and nurture me and love me to make sure that I was whole. So now it's like, it's my duty to pass that on to other people and to show people like, all right, it doesn't matter whether you were incarcerated, whether you were poor, it doesn't matter what background, what walk of life you come from. If you want to get educated, it's possible. No, like I'm like, got to sit there with that for a second because a lot of people don't realize that it's possible. And a lot of times I've found in life that people will think that once you've made a mistake because it doesn't even have to be being incarcerated it's once you've made a mistake that's it like that mistake is what defines you that mistake is the thing that writes the rest of your history but that's not true like we are not we are not our mistakes our mistakes are lessons our mistakes can even be guides at times because sometimes it's our mistakes that get us to the right direction. We wouldn't have a microwave oven if it wasn't for a mistake. Yep. Like if we think about it like that. Somebody accidentally put a candy bar on something and realized, oh, this does something else. And so we are not our mistakes, but our mistakes can help guide us and lead us and direct us. So for you to share with people and let them know that, you know, you can still do it, you can still give back, you can still love yourself enough to go deeper and go further and expand your mind that is an amazing thing like absolutely as people of color i feel like we've been i don't know taught to see ourselves in a light that is less than or like see these institutions as something bigger than life that we can't attain like all this is possible no matter what walk of life no matter what your past is if you love yourself be present in this moment today and strive to be better than you were yesterday. Like whatever happened in the past is already done and over with and just continue to move forward. Like that's the one message of love that I could spread to people is be present in today and you know, think of your future and do whatever you have to do today in order to love yourself, love your community and love the people around you. Nice. Okay, so let's take a moment and I want you to be able to I know you shouted out your teacher but think about other people in your life as well and talking about um, you know black and brown love and 
the community around you? Are there people that you want to shout out or other people that you're like, you know, if it weren't for them, I wouldn't be who I am today? Just give you a moment if you would like. Um, I would honestly have to shout out the men that I was incarcerated with. These men, they were serving life sentences. They had their own things going on. Their problems were bigger than mine. When they had came into the institution, they were worse off than I was. Yet they saw the potential in me. They nurtured me. They gave me books before the, the college ever saw potential in me. They offered me programs. They offered me guidance. I've never seen mental health. We know what the stigma is in, in the black community when it comes to mental health services. So I vented to my friends. So I want to give a shout out to Kentel Weaver, to Mac Hudson, to Ray Colon, to Kevin Keogh, Alexander Bowling. Like there were so many men. They all had so much potential. And they used that in me. They inspired me to be a better man. And now, I, in turn, I'm inspiring other people. So like, I feel like that's the most beautiful thing that somebody could do when it comes to love is inspire the next person to continue loving themselves and continue loving other people. You just said something that s- sparked something in my head. I'm like, ah, yes, let's touch on that. Because you talked about mental health. And one thing that is a huge, huge stigma is the idea of men and mental health, but not just men, black and brown men and mental health. Like, apparently they're not supposed to be in conversation together. No. But what is your take on mental health as as a man? My take on mental health is it's very necessary. As much as, you know, it might not feel as good as you would think. It's not something that's, you know, a happy-go-lucky situation. Like, it's, it's real serious at times, and you're going to dig, you're gonna have to dig deep into emotional scars and layers that maybe you haven't touched in a while and you might not feel so good but we cannot continue as black and brown people to bottle up our emotions they are going to become volatile and eventually explode just because you are vulnerable does not make you weak like we need to continue to perpetuate these narratives and push like tell all people of color you whether you even if you don't want to seek professional help or services talk to your pastor talk to your professor talk to your best friend talk to your mother talk to somebody who understands you and knows you you know who these people are but bottling it up is never the solution and maybe we're not going to get to a point in time where everybody's seeing a clinician but at least everybody will be talking to each other like let's do this as a community it's got to be has to be coming together as a community because if we keep people stuck in their own individual life like they're gonna drown nobody people are so walking around worried about their own lives so much nobody stops to check if their fellow person of color is okay and that's all i ask people to do is check on each other and when you're going through something share that because that's i had depression I have PTSD, I have anxiety, and when I go through things, I'm not afraid to pick up the phone. I'm not afraid to, you know, go talk to somebody and see them in person, like, yo, listen, give them a hug, like, yo, I'm going through some things, and I need help. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. We're here together. As humanity, we're, we're, here, we're here as one. All right. So let's, we're going to go forward for a bit, and then we're going to go back one more time, all right? So looking forward, what do you envision for David, like future David? Uh, future David, um, I see multiple college degrees. I want a PhD one day. Um, I want to have my own nonprofit organization that's helping at-risk youth, that's giving kids education reform, teaching them these life skills, teaching them these mental health skills, teaching them emotional intelligence. You know, I want to have a curriculum that's throughout multiple cities in Massachusetts and hopefully I can go nationwide one day but I really just want to help the black and brown community like I was helped downstream after I had already destroyed my life and had to repair I feel like it's my job to go upstream and do the work and meet these kids before they go to prison meet these kids before they throw their education away teach them the value of these things so like my, my vision is just making the world a better place with like, you know, whatever way, shape, or form that my skill set, my assets, and my life experience will allow me to do. Okay. Now as we look forward, we're going to expand that a little bit. And as you see, you know, future David, what is your hope when we talk about black love and the black and brown community? What is your hope for the community in the future? My hope for the community in the future is just 
embrace each other, have empathy, see each other with understanding, let's stop being divisive and othering each other based on the smallest things, based on the clothes people wear, the, the money that people have, what neighborhood we're from, like, all this is irrelevant, we are all one people, like, the struggle of the, the black walk of life is a struggle that we all face together, and the only way that we will begin to resolve these problems is by unity. So like love is unity. Like that's the that's the only thing that I want to see people is come together as one. Let's stop being so single minded, cause that ain't, that's not doing anything but destroying us further. Divide and conquer. The powers that be, structural racism. That's how they win. Is by keeping us apart. When we come together, is when when we're gonna be able to rise above. I said, we're going to go forward and then go back a bit. So we're going to go back. First, we're going we're gonna to pause in the middle. We're going to come to the present. Because it's something that I wanted to touch on before we, we go backwards a little bit. And that is that there's something that you did that we didn't get to talk about. That's really kind of special. And so in talking about all the accomplishments and the things that you've done in your how many is how many months did you say already so that I've, I've been you've been home out? For 120 days 120 days that you've been home and in 120 days you my friend are an author now aren't you <laughs> <laughs> i wrote a poetry book it's called days of grace there's it's a mix of poetry like i have some stuff that's a little darker you know from when i was incarcerated and i have my happy moments of me and my daughter I have a mix, you know, a little more educational, a little more revolutionary stuff. But yeah, I'm in the process of really getting the publishing done and publishing my other works, my essays, and really just working on developing my voice as a writer. Because as black people, as the black community, we need writers to tell our story. Our narrative is constantly being told by the oppressor. We need to develop this voice like that is love. Projecting that voice is a form of love because now we are owning our story and as a black author I want to you know perpetuate that on anybody else if you want to become a writer don't be afraid like we all started off with the basic sentences now slowly but surely the intricacies come and you learn the craft and you'll get better so I'm I just want to be able to produce a work of art that is true to the black and brown community this question what got you into poetry specifically um i want to say like it was just an outlet for me to like project my emotions i want to say like i was just writing and it just started to flow and i learned about meter and how to structure it through college and i just ran with it like i don't know i just do it out of emotion if i feel inspired and it's something that triggers me like i'll just get a pen and start jotting stuff down and whatever comes out comes out and we format it after it's just a, it's like a brainstorming and then i'll come back and edit after but somehow i don't know i've always had like a poetic meter at least according to my professor i can see that <laughs> um okay so now with all of that and everything that we talked about now we're gonna go back to the beginning again and i asked you to talk about you know young david I want to go back to young David again and if you could tell young David something give young David a conversation what would you say then I would say don't be don't be afraid to be yourself don't be afraid of what anybody thinks of you or don't feel like you have to live up to anybody else's name or persona like I struggled with identity my whole life as a kid. My father was in the street. He was a gangbanger. He was in 15 in federal prison. His name is also David. So I'm David Jr. And it was just, I emulated that. I looked up to him. I was so worried about being him, being David 2.0, that I was never David Jr. I never got to develop my own identity until I was removed from that environment and was incarcerated and was forced to spend time with myself. So, like, it, it was a blessing in disguise, honestly, but I just, I would have told myself to be patient because we don't know what we're going to become. Like, growth is just, it happens on its own. Like, you can't, you can't be ready for growth. It's just going to happen, and however you respond to it, how you adapt to life after that 
is what it is, but I was so, you know, as a kid, that's how it is, especially in these inner city communities, like, we want to grow up so fast, we want to do everything that adults are doing, but that doesn't happen without putting in the work as a kid, like, you have to really develop and grow, and I, I felt like I stunted my growth, I, I didn't allow myself to pace myself. That is all that I have for you for right now. I want to thank you. I want to thank you, thank you, thank you with all of my heart for coming on. I want to thank you for sharing. And I want to thank you for being you and who you are in my life. You are an inspiration. And I pray that as you go forward and as you continue your journey, that the PhD won't even be like the top top because where you're headed to and what you're going to do that there's just so much love that you have inside to give and that people would see it. But I pray that as you give love, that it will continue to come back to you and be poured into you like never before. And that you'll continue to see love everywhere you go. And as you walk in whatever it is that you do that you'll see those little moments of things that's like wow that's a reminder of how loved I am and how important I am so I want to say as a black woman to you I love you and I'm proud of you I see you and I hope that you continue to just thrive and shine and make this world a better place because I believe that we can't make it without each other. So you are important, you are needed, and just know you are loved. So with that being said, that is the end of this episode. If you would like to learn more about David outside of this podcast, David, how can the people reach you? Um, I'm on Facebook, David Del Valle. Um, my email, David Del Valle, 1993 at gmail.com do speeches at high schools, inner city youth, I talk about education reform, criminal justice reform, social justice, like I touch a lot of topics that need to be spoken on to these kids, to society in general. If anybody, you know, is interested in making the world a better place in whatever way they can, I'm here, whatever, whatever resources, and, you know, we can come together and I'm, I'm blessed to be here. Thank you so much, Ariel. I appreciate the love and, you know, let's continue to inject love into this world in every space. Yes. Oh. I love you. I love you. Too. All right. That is it, everyone. I'll see you all next week when we'll have another guest. You can see... Like I said, they're amazing people. You see how amazing David is. So stay tuned because next week is going to be good too. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. That's all for now on Good Morning Love. You can continue talking with me on Instagram at Arielle Chanel or on Facebook at Arielle Chanel Music. Let me know what you think. And until next time, remember, always wake up with love.